Hello, and welcome to the Drake Spams. I'm Mr. Quack, and I hope your day is less quack than mine. Today, we're going to be looking at Undeath and Resurrection and how it works. If you'd like to support the creation of this content, hit the subscribe button. If you like this content, hit the like button. If you'd like to stay notified on the quackery, hit the bell below, or you can follow me on Twitter. I would also like to thank Locke from Chinese and Lock Use with some help on this theory. So I know I'm a bit late to the topic, but ever since the raising of Della and Summer Moon and Sarah Moon Warden, there have been questions about how resurrection works in World of Warcraft. The main question being, how much free will does a resurrected person really have? In particular, the Forsaken. Della and Sarah were fierce protectors of the Night Elves, so the fact they switched sides to the Forsaken with seemingly little regard for their past lives and no struggle seems to make absolutely no sense unless we're dealing with something similar to the Scourge. I personally, however, think their resurrection makes perfect sense, and surprising enough, I don't think it's because Sylvanas has gone for Lich Queen. Yet. The reason I think Dilaran and Syra suddenly shift their allegiances is because their resurrection is playing on the law of resurrection, and basically gives an insight into how Sylvanas is bringing back people who are loyal to the Horde and or just her. What law am I talking about? Well, before I get to that, I just need to establish what Resurrection is in WoW. Resurrection in WoW is the bringing back of a spirit from either A, the Shadowlands, or any realm that sits in equivalence to or beyond the Shadowlands, like the Emerald Dream, or the other side, or B, the places beyond the Shadowlands, like the other side. I give these two options because depending on which camp you sit in, the Shadowlands in your eyes may not be where spirits go to rest, but instead it's just a place they pass through. I do also explicitly mean the spirit as well. Creatures can be resurrected into various forms and objects. A perfect example of this is Kalthuzzad, who after being resurrected with the power of the Sunwell, had his spirit attached to a phylactery instead of a body, and in turn made him a lich. I also want to make this clear. Liches once raised, demons and elementals do not innately go through resurrection every time they are defeated. They instead, technically, go through a form of regeneration. The only time a demon, for example, would be fully resurrected is if they are killed in the Twisting Nether and then brought back to life. A good example of this is Varimathras. Varimathras is dead. He should not be coming back. If Varimathras makes a return, something will have had to have resurrected him. Alright, so now that we've got the definition out of the way, there are four things that influence resurrection. The first is time. How long has the spirit been gone for? The second is who? Who is the spirit being raised? Third is will. How powerful is the will of the person raising the spirit? And the fourth is magic. How much lingering magic is left in the raised creature? That's it. These four things influence all resurrection you see in World of Warcraft. From what players do in Raid to the dredges of the Scourge. How do these four things do this? Well... How long a spirit has been dead for is the easiest to explain. The closer to the time of death a person is resurrected, the easier they are to resurrect. So it is generally easier to resurrect spirits that have died recently than those that have died years ago. Who is being raised also affects the difficulty of the resurrection. Depending on who the creature is and how they died, the creature will either be more innately susceptible or resistant to resurrection. If a creature dies under good circumstances, then they will likely be harder to resurrect no matter what. If a creature dies horribly or under dubious circumstances, they will likely be easier to resurrect no matter what. If a person has a strong faith or a strong will, they will likely be more difficult to resurrect, but more powerful in death, and in turn more difficult to control. If a creature has a weak will, they will likely be easier to resurrect and control but also be weaker in undeath. Also, if a creature has a strong spirit, then the amount of power needed to bring that spirit back will likely be increased. If the power to raise a strong spirit is not met, then what will most likely happen is either a failure to resurrect or a partial resurrection. A partial resurrection is when a person is resurrected, but only part of that person is resurrected. Partial resurrections make up most resurrections seen in World of Warcraft, but I'll get back to that later. The will of a person raising the dead is admittedly more of an optional point, as power seems to be the only requirement in raising a spirit. However, 
where this aspect is optional, most resurrections seen in World of Warcraft demonstrate this aspect. The most prominent example in WoW of someone implanting their influence into the resurrection process is Lich King. Lich King raised many of the Scourge and dominated them with his will. It should be noted though, if the spirit that is raised has a strong spirit, the will of the Razor can be overridden. The best examples of this are Sylvanas and the play of Death Knight, who broke Lich King's control after he was weakened. Lastly, lingering magic affects the resurrected by influencing their personality. This aspect basically shares space with the spirit that is resurrected. To explain that further, basically when partial resurrection occurs, the Razor will only bring back a portion of the original spirit, but will then basically be used to fill out the holes within said spirit is magic. This magic is usually the magic used for the resurrection, and depending on the amount of magic used, a form of magical overflow will occur and grant the resurrected new powers. What should be noted though is that the more lingering magic within a creature that is resurrected, the more susceptible they are to all forms of manipulation, both magic and otherwise, unless the soul of the resurrected or the will of the razor is extremely strong. Okay, so now that we've gotten the basics out of the way, I'm going to give a few practical examples of how these basics apply in World of Warcraft. Now, I cannot overstate how difficult full resurrections are. Even after someone has recently died, they are still extremely difficult. To give some context to what I'm saying, I'm pretty sure there have only been four full resurrections that have ever occurred in World of Warcraft. The first is Kel'Thuzzad, when he was resurrected as a Lich. Arthas used the power of the Sunwell to bring him back. The second is Varian, who Anduin brought back in the Bloods of Our Father short story from Cataclysm. Anduin seemed to use a very, very potent form of the light to do so. The third and fourth time full resurrection has occurred relates to Sylvanas. The second time Sylvanas died, a Valkyr brought her back by replacing herself with Sylvanas in whatever afterlife Sylvanas had entered. And the third time Sylvanas died, Three Valkyrie sacrificed themselves to bring Sylvanas back. In all these instances, a large amount of power was required to bring these spirits back fully from the dead. Arthas' Death Knights are probably the best example of powerful partial resurrections. And if we're going to give numbers to what I'm describing, the numbers would look like this. When Lich King raises a Death Knight, he raises about 30 to 50% of a Death Knight's original spirit which is a lot, I might add, and basically locks that spirit under his will. The rest of that spirit is then filled with lingering magic. The result is the class we know as the Death Knight, a spirit that is about a 50-50 split between the original personality and basically necromantic magic. The overflow of magic that was used for said resurrection is say about 40%, and this is where the Death Knight gets their power from. Now, when Light's Hope happened and the Death Knights were freed from the Lich King's control, those percents don't really change. What happened was Locke on the Death Knight spirits was released, and they all technically gained free will. The percents of the Death Knight, however, do change over time. What I mean by this is the 50-50 split that is present in a Death Knight spirit may fluctuate. Death Knights do have a consistent need to kill to remain sane. If this theory is correct, then what is happening to the Death Knight is the 50% of their spirit that is themselves is degrading. And so to replenish it, what they need to do is absorb blood, which after the events of BFA should obviously be seen as being connected to spirits. I'd also like to add, this degradation in Death Knights does not affect their magical capability. If anything, you could argue as the imbalance grows, their connection to death increases. The Forsaken are very similar to the Death Knights. The only differences at first are the numbers. When a Forsaken is first raised, they generally have less of themselves and less magical overflow. So for example, a Forsaken will have say 10% to 20% of their original spirit and have the other 80% of their spirit belong to necromantic magic. A Forsaken's magical overflow really depends on the class, but it's still pretty low. Forsaken Warriors, for example, will have no magical overflow, while Forsaken Mages 
may have 10%. Another difference in the Forsaken compared to the Death Knights is a lock on their spirit. Sylvanas so freed the Forsaken from Arthas's lock, and contrary to the rumblings, I do not believe Sylvanas has started to put a lock back on the Forsaken yet. Anyway, as time progresses, the difference between the Death Knights and Forsaken starts to become very clear. A Forsaken's personal spirit does not degrade like a Death Knight's. It actually seems to be able to do the exact opposite and grow. What a Forsaken's spirit seems to do is grow and replace the magic within their spirit. Basically, what happens is a shift in their spirit. The 20 to 80 percent turns into a 50 50 split, and as time goes over, their spirit seems to shift more into the realm of a living creature. The result here is the Forsaken start to become more alive. They start to feel more emotions and remember certain things. The result is basically the Desolate Council, and to some extent as well, Sylvanas. In Before the Storm, the Desolate Council proved the Forsaken can be far from heartless dolls that have no remorse and little free will. And where Sylvanas' ruthlessness is a constant that has never disappeared, saying she's the same person she was when she was resurrected would be plainly doing a disservice to the character and ignoring her growth. Sylvanas' experience in Undeath have shaped the way she is today. What I will say though, is of all Forsaken, she represses this growth the most, clinging to the darkness within herself, stopping herself from feeling any emotion, except when she has her outbursts of anger. The one emotion that was definitely brought back when she was resurrected, and seems exacerbated by the magic within her soul. Now, with everything I've just said about the Forsaken and Resurrection, Sira, Deloran, and what Sylvanas is currently doing should start to make a lot more sense. The reason why is the Forsaken recently risen by Sylvanas almost instantly give her loyalty and betray their past lives. This is because Sylvanas is raising the parts of their soul that are angry, hopeless, and distraught. You see, if you have the power to raise 25% of a person's spirit, but need them for a certain purpose, would you raise that 25% that's hard to control, or would you raise 10% and make sure that 10% is agreeable to your purpose? With the resurrection of Deloran, Sylvanas likely brought back her anger for Elude, but left her loyalties to the Night Elves in the grave, and it's a similar situation for Syrah. Instead of bringing back Syrah Moonmorden, what was brought back was the anger and contempt of Syrah Moonmorden. This is a technicality Sylvanas is using to create her army. Sylvanas technically hasn't crossed the line into Lich Queen territory, yet by locking the Forsaken's will to her own. Instead, she raises the parts of the spirit that are willing to follow her when raised. And as I mentioned earlier, the more magic that remains within a raised person's spirit, the more susceptible to all kinds of influence they become. This is the technicality Sylvanas is playing on within Resurrection. This is a truly disturbing tactic on Sylvanas' part. But what I ask is, is it as bad as what Lich King did? Because as I stated earlier, these pieces of the soul will grow over time. They will likely remember things and feel more emotions than just despair and anger. If anything, these spirits are technically newborn beings that just need time to express their free will. The Forsaken are not the people they were in life, as quite possible in death, their experiences fundamentally create a new person altogether, even if they remember their past lives. But once again, does this justify Sylvanas' actions of using newborn creatures as weapons? But that's some food for thought. So this is arguably not even a form of resurrection. But, as it has close ties to Undeath and the Undead, I figured it's worth mentioning. Especially considering the technicalities behind it seem to have been going somewhere for quite some time. Familiar Resurrection is basically when the Razor, instead of raising the spirit, specifically goes after the corpse of the deceased. What the Razor basically does is pump a corpse full of magic and then exerts their will over that magic, which just happens to be in a corpse. The result is an Undead Familiar with 100% magic and 0% spirit within the body. The Army of the Undead ability used by Death Knights, a large portion of the Scourge, 
and what Sylvanas did during the Battle of Lordaeron are probably the best examples of this magic. In some instances, Familiar Resurrection will bring back a part of the spirit. That part, however, will be minuscule, as in maybe a point of a percent that will only provide minor sentience. And a Holy DK's pet and some quest givers around the Shadow Vault in ICC are probably the best examples of this phenomenon. Now, the interesting thing about Familiar Resurrection is depending on the magic, the familiar may end up remaining after the Razor has finished with the spell. What I'm talking about is with a DK's Army of the Undead, once the duration of the spell is finished, the undead fall apart. This reaction, however, doesn't apply to the Scourge. The Scourge, for whatever reason, will remain after Lich King disappears. So what the Scourge basically are is a chromantic magic in a corpse waiting for a powerful being to control them. The reason this is important is probably not the reason you're thinking, because yes, where this is context to the line, there must always be a Lich King, as without one, the Scourge would just spread pure necromancy across Azeroth. What's really interesting though, is what this type of resurrection creates, and what resurrection as a whole might bring back with it. You see, if the magic that created the Scourge is lingering in the physical universe, then what has technically happened is someone has drawn a very potent form of magic into the universe, and has just left it in a corpse. And as I mentioned earlier, in some cases, these husks of magic gain minute sentience. Now, the question I ask you is, how mad do you think it would be if this magic, or any magic used for resurrection, started to gain sentience? How powerful do you think that creature would be, and what do you think their intent would be? The joke about these questions as well is, I'm not pulling this idea of magic getting sentience out of my ass. If you look up the creation of the Lich King in Chronicle Volume 3, you find out it's quite possible. Nazul may have been the original spirit, but the creature inside didn't gain the name the Lich King by accident. Death basically infused itself with what remained of Nazul's broken spirit and created a new creature. That creature being the Lich King. And we all know what the Lich King's goal was and how powerful the Lich King was. And what's also really interesting about this concept of magic walking around in corpses is have you ever asked yourself what the Withered from Suramai are? I know I didn't until Locke from Chinese and Lucky's pointed out, but here's the reality. The Withered are technically arcane undead. I mean, it's in their description. The Withered are nightfallen who couldn't feed their arcane addiction. They are literally elves that starve to death, but as is seen with the Withered, their bodies did not rest. The Nightborn and the Nightfallen before the Arkandor were so full of arcane magic that when they starved to death, the magic within them took their bodies and remained in the universe, searching for more magic. This lingering potent magic cannot be good news for us or Azeroth, though if you want to know something even more disturbing, what do you think possessed the elves that died during the Sundering in the Azhara Sinmac? Because the three things I am almost certain of is A. It wasn't arcane magic. B. It wasn't the old gods. And C. It terrified Azhara. So here's another question I ask you. What happens if magic itself, or deities of magic, start to want into the physical universe? And I'm not talking about creatures I might add, like demons, faceless, or the Naru. What I'm talking about is magic itself looking for a way into the universe, and what hell that could cause. But once again, that's just some food for thought. The main point here is resurrection in World of Warcraft has an understandable system. Sylvanas is using this system to create new forsaken lower to her without using the same dominance the Lich King exerted. Sylvanas makes her forsaken loyal by raising the aspects of a person that would be willing to follow her cause. These aspects usually relate to anger and abandonment. So I'm just adding this little bit here because I honestly don't think I've gotten across how strange the Forsaken are. Because where I do stand by everything I've said, the Forsaken's ability to grow in undeath is truly strange. Especially considering Death Knights, who share a very similar fate, seem to only decay. I have two possible explanations for this, it all relates to the name Forsaken. Now I wish to think the Forsaken were given their name because Savance was playing on the fact their situation warranted the name. 
as in the universe had basically forsaken them to a fate worse than death. However, after Elegy and Delirant's death, the name, for me, seems to have gained more meaning. What I'm referring to is before Delirant dies, she forsakes Loon and her faith. She technically becomes faithless and forsakes her own goddess before dying, barring herself from any form of afterlife for Loon. This action on the outset might not seem that significant, however, it made me wonder, what if that's why the Forsaken are called Forsaken? As in their name isn't just there because of their circumstances, but in reality, they are literally severed from the universe. The implication here being, before Sylvanas freed the Forsaken, they are attached to necromancy through the Lich King. However, when she shattered that connection, she shattered the Forsaken's connection to the universe's magics. Now, I know you're probably thinking, that makes no sense. The Forsaken can use X, Y, and Z class. And to that, I agree. And it's precisely why I think the Forsaken are related to another magic than just death. In a bit of content I made ages ago, a link will be provided, I mentioned the idea of spectrums of magic. These magics are basically greater magics than the ones that we know of, and encompass a lot more of the cosmology map. One of these greater magics was called Oblivion Magic which, to put simply, makes the Void look cute and cuddly. Oblivion magic is one of the magic I have that relates to what powers the Forsaken, as it's basically a force that can exert its influence over most of the concepts in the universe, however still relates to undeath without being attached to the Void. The other theory surrounding this topic that still relates to the name Forsaken is the idea that the Forsaken are basically powered by what I can only describe as antimatter. Now, I'm not talking about literal antimatter, but more the concept. The foundation here is that everything we see on the cosmology map, including the Void, is the quote-unquote matter universe. What we don't see, however, is the antimatter universe, which, by this theory, does exist, except the only shades of it we've seen are in the Forsaken, who, due to their circumstances, draw on that power to exist and grow. This last part has very little evidence to support it, however the Forsaken, when it comes to undeath, are strange, and I figured these theories might have some merit. But with all that said, do you think this is plausible or possible? Leave a comment. Best speculation is always done with the community. If you prefer to talk about your lore though, I usually hang out in the Shiny to Luck Dudes Discord. And even if I'm not there, the small community that usually is, is amazing to talk lore, speculation, or anything World of Warcraft with. So until next time, have a nice day!